Amen. So keep your place in Zephaniah chapter 1. We're going to get back to that story in just a few minutes. But look at the front of your bulletins um, real quickly. and Look at the verse of the week. So, so this evening, so, uh, this morning we talked about, you know, how to, how to financially um, get through hard times, some things um, that you can do in your life according to um, some principles from the Bible. In Proverbs 18, verse number 9, the Bible says, He that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. So we talked about, you know, wasting uh, this morning. We talked about not being a waster, how we waste a lot of things in this country, and how, you know, we can not waste things will help us in our lives um, as far as financially, as far as just physically things that we need. Um, we looked at that. But look at the first part of the verse where it says, he that is slothful in his work. So here the Bible is compa comparing being slothful or what we would say, as laziness, the Bible is comparing laziness to wasting. So laziness, think about what laziness is. You know, we talk about, you know, laziness is the opposite of someone who's a hard worker, right? So if you're lazy, you're not a hard worker. That's kind of the two ends of those spectrums right there. But the point is, is that laziness is a result of something. Laziness is something that you already are. Right? So laziness, if, you, if you're uh, familiar with the, the cause and effect, you know, uh, paragraphs from, you know, eighth grade English class or whatever it is, is that there was, a, there was a cause of something and then there was an effect, okay? So somebody did something and it, the effect was this. You know, laziness is an effect of something, all right? So somebody is already, if somebody's lazy, it's, it's something that they're doing. It's something that they're, even though they're doing nothing as being lazy, but it's an effect. Turn to Isaiah. Keep your place in Zephaniah chapter 1. And then turn to Isaiah chapter 32. And the thing that laziness is an effect of is this. It's this idea of complacency. So the sermon tonight is on complacency and what the problem is with complacency. What is complacency? Complacency is literally um, is not caring about something. So if you're complacent, about something, you're careless about that thing. So many people are complacent about certain things in their life, but more and more you are seeing in the country, especially that we live in today, people that just don't seem to care about anything at all. All right, I saw a sign um, driving um, to church this morning, a sign on the freeway, and it said, it said, um, don't drive drunk, it said. And that's not all that it said, though. It said, no, it said, drunk driving saves lives. That's what it said. And then at the bottom part of the, there was another part that said, the life saved could be your own. And I'm thinking, that's pretty brilliant for that person who wrote that because it says, drunk driving saves lives. But here's the thing. A lot of people don't care about other people's lives. So they put another addition to that phrase that, hey, could be even your own life because they're, they're hoping, that person that wrote that is hoping that this person at least cares about their own life. They may be a selfish person that's complacent about all the lives of the people around them, but they're trying to really point to that selfish person and say, look, even your own life, because they're, look, they're trying to just grab on to maybe the last thing that that person who's going to drive drunk actually cares about. Because people are so complacent today that it's not a guarantee that you would care about the lives of other people. That's why they put that second line on that freeway sign here on, you know, on the freeway. So look, complacency, laziness, it comes from complacency. If you're lazy, if you don't work hard, you just lay around, that's all you do. You're already lazy. It's just you, you don't care and you've become lazy. Look at Isaiah chapter 32 and look at verse number 9. Look what the Bible says. It says, rise up. Isaiah was a prophet, you know, at the end of the lower kingdom of Judah's uh, reign. He says, rise up, you women that are at ease. Hear my voice, ye careless daughters. I'm sorry, he was a, a prophet of Judah during the northern kingdom's um, Assyrian takeover or Assyrian, um, when the Assyrian empire destroyed them. Rise up, ye women that are at ease. Hear my voice, ye, what does it say? Ye careless daughters, give ear unto my speech. Many days and years 
Shall ye be troubled, ye careless women? Here he says, careless again. For the vintage shall fail, the gathering shall not come. It says, tremble, ye women, that are again, what does it say? At ease. Be troubled, ye careless ones. Strip you and make you bare and gird sackcloth upon your loins. So here, Isaiah, I'm going to give you three thoughts about complacency this evening. And this leads us into our first thought right here. Notice how he says, he's like, he's trying to get them up. He's like, he's trying to get their attention. He's like, wake up, rise up. And they're careless. How many times has he said the word careless? They don't care about anything. He's like, don't care. He's like, you're careless. He doesn't mean they're careless like they stumble around. He means they literally don't care about anything. And he's saying, look, you should be trembling. He's like, you should be trembling. You should not be these complacent people. So the first point I want to make about complacency this evening is this. Complacency comes from comfort. Complacency comes from comfort. Now do you see why it's an American problem? Complacency? Look at verse number 11. He says, tremble ye women. He's saying, be afraid. Tremble. He's like, be scared. Be fearful. Instead, what are they? What are the next words? He says, ye women that are at ease. They're just, they're totally relaxed. Isn't that the opposite of trembling? They're totally relaxed when they should be in fear. He's trying to convince them. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. So the first point I want to make about complacency, I want to kind of give you an idea of where it comes from. Okay, how do people, because we can look at these three points that I'm going to make, and then we can look at complacency, and we can look at these three points, and we can make sure that we don't become complacent. We can, we can see the complacency. We can understand how so many people are becoming complacent today, but we can also take heed for ourselves that we don't become complacent in our lives. So here there was these women that were at ease. They were, they were, everyone was just relaxed, and he's saying, tremble, be afraid. Look at the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. We see something very similar in Revelation chapter 3. We studied through these churches. Laodicea, they were neither cold nor hot. They were just kind of meh. They were just kind of there. All right, but look what he says in verse 17. Look what Jesus says in verse 17. He says, because thou sayest. So first of all, the first thing you need to understand about verse 17 here is, is this real? Is this a real thing? It says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and what? And have need of nothing. So the first thing you need to understand is, these people are very comfortable. That's the first point on complacency. But look what he says next. He says, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So these people in this church are like, we're good. They're like, we're good. We have, we have nothing that we need. We're rich. We don't need anything. But the point I'm trying to get at is, was that the truth? Was it the truth that they needed nothing? Was it the truth that they were increased in goods? No, it said that he, he, Jesus himself says, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, he says. And they think that they're the opposite. Doesn't that sound familiar to Isaiah chapter 32? where the women are just completely at ease. And he's saying, no, you should be afraid. It's kind of like somebody, just imagine, you know, a picture of somebody sitting on a train track, just sitting there and just meditating on a train track as a, as a freight train is bearing down upon them. This is the kind of picture that Jesus is giving in Revelation chapter 3 and that Isaiah was giving in Isaiah chapter 32. He's saying, you're at ease and you should be afraid. You should be going up to that person on the train track and saying, you don't seem to care about anything right now. But there's a train right there. You should care. Okay? Now, just think about this. Think about, you say complacency. Why is it such a big problem? Think about if Satan could convince people that they had no need of salvation. Imagine. Imagine if Satan could convince people to be complacent about their need for salvation. Because think about it. I mean, think, think about how silly this is. What are we doing when we go out soul winning? Are we selling something? Are we selling anything? You know, I knock on no soliciting doors all the time because I'm not selling anything. 
We're actually showing people how to get something that's free. But the vast majority of people don't want it. Imagine if you're walking around with a bag with bags of gold and imagine nobody wanting it. But that's what we're, we're talking about. We're literally walking around with the instruction for people to have eternal life. And most people don't want it. Why? Because Satan has convinced them to be complacent. They don't care. They're at ease. They're not, they're not trembling about anything. That's why when we do talk to somebody, what's the first thing that we do? We talk to them about, we don't talk to them about, here's how you get eternal life immediately. We talk to them about their sin. We talk to them about the consequences for their sin. Because what are we trying to do? We're trying to get them from that place of ease to a place where they're, they're trembling, they're afraid. Because that is what? That's the truth. The truth is, is that they're miserable, they're poor, they're wretched. Anybody who's ever been saved realizes that they were miserable, they were poor, and they were wretched. Look, they may have thought before somebody talked to them about the gospel that I don't really need anything. Thank God they had enough you know, motivation or, or right spirit within them to listen to the word of God so they could get to that point. But complacency is the problem today. People just don't care. Look, this idea of complacency, this idea that people just don't care, it's sending people straight to hell. It's a big deal. And the Bible talks a lot about it. This is the American problem today. Because guess what? Ease, comfort, sitting back on your lees, as we just heard in Zephaniah chapter 1. Everybody wants to be comfortable today. I mean, isn't, I mean, that's the goal for people today, is to just be comfortable. I was explaining, uh, Jacob and I were working yesterday, and I was explaining it to him, the idea of a vacation. You know, this concept of a vacation, and I was telling him, like, you know what, when we go camping, and we, we go fishing, like, it's way more fun when it's sandwiched between hard work. Like, hard work, hard work, hard work, fishing. And then hard work, hard work, hard work. That makes that vacation just all that much more enjoyable. Because guess what? Think about the last vacation that you went on. You think about the last vacation you went on. You know that if, if that would just be your life? Because this is what people want to do. This is what the rich people do. This is what the celebrities do or whatever. People that have all kinds of money, this is what they do. They just make their life a, a perpetual vacation. If you went on vacation, think about your last vacation, wherever you were. Maybe you went you know, to some place on the coast or wherever you went. If you would just stay there and that would be your life, you would be miserable. Like you would get sick of it. You would be bored. You would be miserable. But people want to like, have their life become a perpetual vacation. It doesn't work that way. You would just be miserable. You have to sandwich it between hard work. And then it's rewarding. That's why a vacation feels like a vacation. Even, look, even secular people have figured this out. There's a, there's a guy that wrote a book. Um, and I don't endorse this guy. I've only heard about him a couple times. I'm sure that, I, you know, I don't endorse him at all. I don't endorse the book either. But it's interesting some things that secular people observe. His name is Michael Easter, and he wrote a book called The Comfort Crisis. Think about that, The Comfort Crisis in the United States. He says, he makes, the, he makes the case, Easter makes the case that modern life might be too cushy for our emotional and psychological well-being. You know, I love when, like, you know, modern, you know, journalists and scientists, like, catch up to the Bible, right? I love that. He's saying that, like, this life of comfort may not be good for us. Imagine that. When all of our most fundamental needs, he continues, when all of our most fundamental needs, food, warmth, and safety, are so thoroughly and perpetually satisfied, he says we not only lose our appreciation for what we have, but we also move the goalposts and fixate on social comparisons that make us miserable. This is the keeping up with the Joneses. This is somebody that lives in a super nice neighborhood and a super nice house, and all they, could carry, all they think about now is like how somebody has it better than them. And then he says, quote, he says, a lot of people don't realize how good they have it because they've never had it bad. Yeah. This is America. 
right here. This is America right here. You know, this is the, the, the person that, that, you know, they get the house and they got to get set up with the TV and the recliner and, you know, they just want to sit home and, you know, the second they experience, what are the three things that he, 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 he uh, named? Food, warmth, and safety. Like the second, this is why people waste so much food, by the way, as we talked about this morning, is because, God forbid, you would experience hunger for an hour before supper time. Because the minute anybody in this country experiences any kind of hunger, they're like, ah, oh, Cheetos, or whatever. And then dinner time comes around and they don't want to eat their food. Because that's how we become great wasters. But the point is, it's just nobody wants to, it, we, we have this philosophy in this country that any kind of struggle, any kind of discomfort, anything but complete ease is bad. And that's wrong. That's wrong. People have never been cold. They've never been hot. You know, if they're hungry for five seconds, they eat something right away. I mean, they're in the safety of their own home. They, they're trying to be on a perpetual vacation. Any kind of discomfort, and they just can't handle it. This is how people get complacent. They're too comfortable. They're too comfortable. Now go back to Zephaniah chapter 1. So we see the first point I'm trying to get you to understand is where complacency comes from. Complacency comes from... This idea of being careless, of not caring about anything, it comes from too much ease, as the King's Bible, in the King James Bible, would say. It comes from too much, too much comfort, as even modern psychologists have figured out. But look at Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at verse number 12. Zephaniah chapter 1. So he's, he's a prophet at the time of King Josiah. You know, right, you know, just a, just a few years before, you know, Judah is going to be taken into captivity. But look what he says in verse 12. He says, it shall come to pass in that time. Remember, these people are sitting on their lees. They're, they're just relaxing. Again, they're at ease as well, just like Isaiah chapter 32. It shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their hearts. So God's saying, Guess what? God's saying, I'm the freight train. It's like, I'm the freight train bearing down the tracks. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish the men that'll, that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. This is another level of complacency right here. So these people, not only were they so comfortable that they were just complacent, they didn't care about anything, they actually transferred that onto God. Those people, are the, they, they said, you know what, God is just like that too. These people actually said that God is complacent. Like, ah, God doesn't care what's going on here. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. They said, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. You know what, they, you know what that means? Here, you know what that means? Here's a translation. Translation is, God doesn't care. That's what those people said in Zephaniah chapter 1. And God, through the prophet Zephaniah, was saying, I do care, and I'm coming to punish you. And these were the people that said, God doesn't care. He doesn't care if we do good. He doesn't care if we do bad. They actually thought God was complacent as well. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6. We see more people like this. More people like this. These people were against the prophets. Because the prophets, the prophets are just, they're just yelling, there's a train coming. Train's coming down the tracks. Trains coming down the tracks. And all of these people were against the prophet, saying, there's no train. God doesn't care. God's complacent. Look at verse 13 of Jeremiah chapter 6. We're just looking at a couple examples. There's dozens and dozens of examples like this in the Bible. Otherwise, they would have listened to the prophets, right? If they cared and they were not complacent, they would have listened to the prophets. Well, look what these people said. From the least of them even unto the greatest of them. Everyone is given to covetousness. So these people are in terrible sin. And, even, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. So here he's saying, everybody's greedy. He's saying, everybody in this nation is greedy. They're covetous. And the prophet and the priest, are even, they're a bunch of thieves, is what he's saying. Even the, even the holy people are a bunch of thieves. A bunch, you know, a bunch of crooks. Look what he says in verse 14. They have, also, they, have, they have healed also the hurt 
of the daughter of my people slightly saying, so this is what there's, he's saying. He's saying all these prophets and priests, here's what they've said to the people. Here's how they've healed them. Here's how they've made them feel better. They've healed the daughter, healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying, peace, peace. But guess what? When there is no peace. Very similar to Isaiah chapter 32 and Revelation chapter 3. These prophets, these prophets are out there saying, this is the pastor today that gets up and says, yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with what's going on in this country. It's okay to murder babies. It's okay to be a pervert. It's okay to do all these, whatever. God will neither do good nor he'll do bad. This is what people, I mean, it's happening today, folks. It's happening today. Jeremiah spoke of the modern day pastor in Jeremiah chapter 6, where he says, what are they saying? They're saying, peace, peace. Hey, love, love everybody. Love, it's, it's all good. It's all good. But look, there is no peace. That's the problem. The problem is what they're saying is not the truth in Jeremiah chapter 6. I mean, it'd be one thing if just peace, peace, because that's what the Bible says. But Jeremiah is saying that they're saying peace and it's making the people feel better, but the train is still coming. All they're doing is making the people feel better as they sit on the tracks, but the train is still going to hit them. That's the problem. That's the problem with Revelation chapter 3, Isaiah chapter 32, and Jeremiah chapter 6 that we just looked at. Complacency is an illusion. This is the problem. So that's point number two. All that to say that, uh, you know, all that to say that complacency is an illusion. So complacency comes from comfort, too much comfort, and complacency is fake. That's the problem. So when you knock on all these people's door, look, when you knock on somebody's door and they're sitting there and you open the door and like a cloud of marijuana smoke comes out of there and they're just like, hey man, we're fine. Here's all good here. Hey, you know, God bless you. You want to hear, you know, what the Bible, no, it's fine. Get, you know, look, hell's going to be just as real for that person, whether they care or not. This is how Satan wins through complacency. Too much comfort. And guess what? It's an illusion. Because it doesn't matter that you care about nothing. It doesn't matter that people in these neighborhoods that we knock on their doors, they literally, you will find these people now, it seems like they literally care about nothing. I mean, it's one thing, like, you know, that you just don't care about anything, but you really care about, like, your car. Or, you know, you really care about your job. Or you really care, you know, you only care about things that pertain to you personally. You're just really selfish. But uh, you just run into people today where it seems like they literally care about nothing. They answer the door. You look at them, you're like, you clearly don't care about yourself. You know, they're just, they're a wreck. They don't care. I mean, it's, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We'll knock on people's door. It's 4.30 in the afternoon on a weekday. And, they, you know, they got, they're in their pajamas. They haven't had a haircut for, I don't know, a year. They, they clearly don't know anything. Look, they don't care about anything. Because I have, to, I have to think that the last thing that you stop caring about is yourself personally. If you don't care about, like, your own health, your own condition of yourself, I mean, you clearly probably don't care about much at all right. is what I'm seeing when I see those people. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is people today. They just don't care about anything. But what's the truth? The truth is, is that that train is still coming. That train is still coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse number 3. Again, the Bible says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then what? Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. It's not going to make any difference, folks. The only difference for people that don't care about anything is that they're not going to know that destruction is there until it's, it's upon them. It's right there. They sit on those train tracks. They're not fearing the train coming, so they're never going to get off the tracks, unfortunately. But this is why we walk around with our free bags of salvation, and nobody wants them. Well, I mean, not nobody, but I mean, many people don't want them. 
because they are complacent. They literally don't care about anything. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Let me give you the third point on complacency. And this is one that we need to pay attention to as well. Because you're like, I'm not complacent. Good. I'm glad you're not complacent. But here's another, you know, why we need to really watch ourselves from becoming complacent people. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse number 19. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 19. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 19, it says, who being past feeling, underline those two words in your Bible, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, that means like uncontrolled lust, okay, to work all uncleanness with greediness. So these people are just like, they're just lustful people. They're in all sorts of sin, uncleanness, greediness, covetousness. So here's what I want to, here's the connection I want to make for you for the third point. The third point is this, complacency, becoming a complacent person, it always leads to sin. So whenever you see somebody that's complacent, you're going to see somebody that is, they're, they're deeply in sin. You say, how do I know that? Because if, they, if, if you, you find somebody that just cares about nothing, they're past feeling, they've lost that self-discipline, they've lost that conscience, they've lost the ability to control themselves. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul talks about this. Paul talks about this. They just, look, they just don't care. They just don't care, so they're led. Basically, it works this way. They don't care about anything, so they're led by the flesh. They're led by whatever desire that they have. I'm hungry now. Eat. You know, I feel like sinning. Sin. They're just not, nothing stops them from going into sin. So complacency, the third point is this. Complacency always leads to sin in people's lives. Because people just don't care. If it feels good, they do it. If their body, their flesh, which is the opposite of what we should be following as Christians, if their flesh tells them to do it, they just do it. Because they don't care. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Look what Paul says that he does. Paul, being led by the Spirit, being somebody that is trying to do the right things for the Lord. Look what he says in verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul here is saying is that I keep my body under... He's talking about his flesh. He's talking about, you know, his flesh, the desires of his body. He says, you know what? I keep that under control, is what he says. And I bring it into subjection. Subjection of what? Subjection of the spirit that is in him. He's, he's, letting, he's, he's saying the spirit in me controls my body. He's like, I am controlling that. He's like, lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's not talking about being cast away from God. He's talking about being a hypocrite to people that he preaches to. He's talking about somebody that would go and preach, be a guest preacher and start churches and train pastors and then just, just be known to be in all this sin that has, he has no control over himself. He's saying no. He's like, I keep my body in subjection. So complacency, this is the thing we need to realize as Christians. Complacency is not neutral. You're like, I just don't care. But here's the thing. The default is sin. The default, being complacent means you follow your sinful desires. You must care and keep this body, as Paul says, in subjection. So that's why just not caring will always lead people into sin. So that's another thing I think about. When you, feed, when you meet somebody at the door, they just care about nothing. I'm just like, man, they just must be in all kinds of sin. And I'm sure that they are. Because somebody that doesn't care about anything is just going to be following whatever lusts and lasciviousness and, and desires that, that their body wants. And that, that will lead you into horrible sin. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So is Christians. So those are the, the three points. The three points is complacency, not caring about anything. It comes from too much comfort. You're like, I like to be comfortable. Look, it's not good for you. It's not good for you to be too comfortable. And if you get, here's the thing, as a saved believer, if you get too comfortable and that leads you down these, and, and you start to believe the illusion, that's point number two, that there is no 
consequences, that there is no train coming. Look, you're not going to lose your salvation, but there's consequences to the chastisement of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And you will pay for the things that you do on this earth. If you believe that you fall into that illusion, you will fall into sin, the Bible says. So we need to be careful. Look back at verse number 24 of verse 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse number 24. Let's think about this from our own perspective as Christians. How can we be careful? Well, Paul, in the verses before talking about how he keeps his body under control, he shows us how to not be complacent. Isn't that interesting how he ties self-control with showing us how to not be complacent in our lives? Look at verse 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Look what, here, here's what he's saying here. Let me translate that for you. What he's saying is there's a lot of people that run in a race, but only one person wins. That's what he's saying. He's like, everybody runs, but only one person wins. He says, so run that ye may obtain. Now, he's talking about the race of the Christian life, but he's comparing it to a secular race or a secular mastery of something. Look at the next verse. Again, he's still... He's still kind of using this secular comparison in verse 25. And he says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, I'll explain that in just a minute. But he says, Now they, that they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. So he's saying, somebody in a worldly competition, you know, they're doing it to, contain a, to obtain a corruptible crown, like a trophy or something that's, 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 that's silly, that's corruptible, that can, you know, moth and rust doth corrupt. He's saying they're doing it to win a worldly prize, okay? But look what he says. He says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. You know what that means? He's like, if you want to master something, you must be temperate. You know what temperate means? It must be self-disciplined. He's comparing. He's saying even people that do worldly competitions and strive for worldly things know this. He's kind of like, hello? Even the world knows this concept, is what Paul is saying. He's saying, you cannot master anything without self-discipline. Okay, so look, the first thing is this. You say, I don't want to be complacent. Well, here's the thing, strive for mastery. Strive for mastery. Ask yourself this. Men, women, kids in the room, do you strive for mastery in your life? Because this is what Paul is telling you to do. He's saying, strive for mastery. See, here's the problem. If all you want is comfort, you will never be a master of anything. Just think of just a, like Paul's using a secular example. Let's think of a, a secular example. Think about um, your job, your, your work. Think about your job. Everybody just wants to be comfortable in their job. Everybody wants to, nobody wants to go to work and feel like an idiot. Who wants to go to work and feel like an idiot? Nobody wants to do that. But here's the thing, that's what you should do. Why? You should go to work and you should figure out your job and then you should figure out, you know, how to do the next hardest thing at that job. Here, here's the trick, folks. Let me, let me tell you guys, you young men, something. Keep yourself confused. When I had my first job out of college, I thought I was an absolute fool for two years. I'd go home and I'd tell my wife, I don't, I don't know if I'm smart enough for this. It's like, just when I think I have it, there's some other complicated aspect of it. But guess what? You get it. But then you know what you should do? Then you guess what? You get comfortable. You figure out how to do something. It's the same thing with ladies, homeschooling, whatever it is that you do, raising your children. You know what? You get in a routine. You get good at it. But guess what? Keep yourself confused. Go push yourself to the next level. Find out, you know what? What does that senior level guy do that I don't do? What kind of skills does he have that I don't have, and learn those things. Always be keeping yourself confused. Don't get comfortable. Because if you get comfortable, you will never become a master. You will never achieve mastery. Now look, this takes, this takes years. This takes decades. I mean, it, studies have shown it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. That's just one thing. 10,000 hours. That's like four years. But then what? Then you master that one thing? Then you get comfortable and chill out for the next 30 years? That's what most people do. But that's not striving 
for mastery. You have to strive. 10,000 hours. Got it. Strive again. 10,000 hours. Keep striving. Keep yourself confused in your life. You know what that takes? You know what that takes? Because you know what, you, you, you know what your flesh wants? Your flesh wants comfort. Your flesh wants to sit back on your lees. Your flesh wants to be at ease, as the Bible is telling us. But you know what? You need to be temperate. You need to be self-disciplined, is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, you want to become a master? You want to strive for mastery? It's like, you have to be temperate. You know, self-discipline means you keep under your body. Your body says comfort. You say, no, forward. This is what Paul is saying. This is how to avoid becoming a complacent person. But it takes temperance. It takes self-discipline. It takes telling your body and your mind to go where it doesn't want to go. That's what it takes. You should always be pushing yourself into things you don't know. Look at verse 26. But is he really talking about a race? I mean, these are all great concepts to take to work. These are all great concepts to take raising your kids. These are all great concepts to take personally for anything that you do. Maybe you just have like goals. You just have fitness goals. Or you have just secular goals that you want to just health goals, whatever. And you want to just do that. Look, that takes self-discipline because you just want to get ice cream and you want to not work out sometimes. You want to do these things and you want to, you want to, be, com you want to be complacent. You want to be comfortable. You have to push your body to do things it doesn't want to do. But really what he's relating this to is the Christian life, is what he's relating it to. You should strive for mastery in the Christian life because just like that secular job, just like whatever goals you have in your secular goals, you know what? This is how growth occurs. This is how growth occurs. As you, and guess what? As you grow in the Christian life, God will open doors for you. I mean, keep in mind, keep in mind that what does God need? God needs people. The laborers are few. The harvest is plenteous. God needs people. God, God, think about it this way. It's like, a, it's like a company that needs a million people, and God has ten. There's always job openings. So he's looking, that's what Paul's saying, strive for mastery in this thing. Don't be getting into sin, because that's just going to derail your Christian life. That's going to put you in the other direction. He's like, we need the people. There's opportunity everywhere. I mean, this is the problem with the Christian, the, the Christian race. This is the problem right here. It's like, I mean, what kind of race have you ever heard of? What kind of race have you ever heard of where somebody did well, where they ran the race for a while? I mean, think about, I mean, how long is the race that Paul's talking about? How long is the race? Isn't it 2 Timothy chapter 4 where Paul says, uh, he's like, I've finished my course. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about his life. He's talking about his whole life. This race is our entire life. How many races have you seen somebody do well in where they run, they run really fast for like 1% of the race and then they stop? They stop racing. They're like, ah, I'm done racing. Does that person do well in, in any race? They stop. And may, hey, maybe they start running again. Maybe they stop for, you know, two years, and then they start running again. They stop, and then they never start. Maybe 15 years later they start. Look, they're not going to do well in the race. There is no, look, there is no good where I'm at in the Christian life. You see what I'm saying? This is the problem with this idea of retirement. The, you know, this idea of retirement, look, I'm not saying that you shouldn't save money and you shouldn't be responsible for, with your money. That's not what I'm saying. But this idea that I'm going to work really hard for 35 years so I can do nothing for the last 30 years of my life, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it does, look, it doesn't translate to the Christian life because Paul ran the race all the way up to the end. When, you know, I think they killed him. You know, that was, when he says, I finished my course, that means like he's dead. That's how long Paul ran the race. There's no, turn to Mark chapter 4. Here's another thing. There's no just like cruise control in the Christian life either. Because if you're like, yeah, you know, I think I'm doing enough right now. I think I'm good. You know, I'm going to take a break. 
and I'm just gonna, you know, uh, work on my business or whatever it is I'm gonna do. Here's the problem with the Christian life, the Christian race. The problem is this, that as soon as, as soon as this careless attitude comes in, that it creates atrophy in the Christian life. As soon as this idea of just not caring works its way into your Christian life, look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 18. These are the problems, because then the thorns work against you in your life. It says, and these are they which are sown amongst the thorns, such as hear the word. This is talking about the parable of the sower, okay? And the, the one that, the seeds that were sown among the thorns, the word of God that was sown among the thorns, are people that hear the word, and what? The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. There's that illusion right there, by the way. The deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of all other things entering in do what? They choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. As soon as you become this careless person in your Christian life, the, the Bible says it is going to destroy your spiritual life. Complacency will kill the, the spiritualness inside you. That's what it's saying. It'll, it'll choke out what you had. That's why it's called deceit. That's why it's called deceitfulness of riches. Just like the ladies, Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3, they thought that they were rich, but that is deceitful. It's not real. It's not real. So that's what it's talking about in Mark chapter 4 when it says the deceitfulness. It doesn't say riches. It says the deceitfulness of riches. It's just people that think, yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to take some time. I, I I've met people like this. They're like, "You know what? I just need to step away from my Christian life for a little bit. I'm just going to make a bunch of money and then I'm just going to do so much good in my life." I I've met several people in my life like that. They're just like, "I just have to like do this really hard right now and I'm going to make a bunch of money and then I'm just going to like do all this spirit-filled stuff with the money." Look, it's deceitful. Because the problem is, as soon as you go over here and you're focused on that, it kills the spirit-filled part of you. It chokes it. It chokes it. It kills it. And it's, it's this idea, this deceitfulness of riches, too. It's like the never-ending vacation. If I, could just, if I could just be at Knott's Berry Farm every day, if I could just be here every day, I would be happy. Look, it's deceitful, because no, you wouldn't. You would be, you would be literally miserable. You know, you think that's what will satisfy you, but that's not what will happen. It will kill your spiritual life. You must keep growing. You know, that, that's, that's retirement today, is the perpetual 30-year vacation. It's like, and, and it never really works out that way. Look, I've seen retirement destroy people. I've seen retirement literally destroy people that I have known and loved my whole life. It just, why? Because it made them complacent. And what does complacent lead, complacency lead to? It leads into terrible sin. Matter of fact, one case, I, I won't mention any names, but one case I can think about many, many years ago. As soon as the retirement of this individual happened and I saw you know, what they were doing with their, their time, I just told my wife, I was like, this is going to end horribly. And it did. Complacency will destroy you. It will destroy your spiritual life. Why? Because in, the race goes to the end. The race goes to the end. You must keep reading. You must keep serving. You must keep studying. You must keep working. You must keep yourself growing in the Christian life. Because if you're not growing, you're going backwards into complacency, into sin. Think about soul winning. Think about soul winning. As if we're all going to figure out this infinite book. I mean, give me a break. Every time I read it, there's new stuff that pops up. I mean, every, I mean, look at the garments of the high priest. What in the world? Look at how deep that is. Look at how deep these studies are in the Bible. As if we're ever going to get it all. Soul winning. As if we're ever going to master soul winning. All the time out soul winning, I'm always thinking, how could I have done that better? Every single one of us has people, probably every week, if you soul win every week, where you're just like, man, is there something I could have said that would have made that guy take it more seriously? Is there something I could have said? Could I have been more persuasive? Could I have been more of a people person? Could I have been, you know, a, a better, you know, ambassador for Christ in that one particular situation? I'm always thinking about that. The one that kills me is just the, 
the super, you know, the, the person that you know just has a great heart. They just have a good heart, and they're just on that bubble of like, maybe I want to listen or maybe I don't. But this complacency has just, it's, it's balled them up. It's wrapped them up. And I'm just like, what could I have possibly have said? How could I be better to, to get through to people like this? Because I, I know there's something you could say to get through to a lot of people. But look, it's all about growing in the Christian life. This, this relentless pursuit of comfort in this country is destroying this country. It, it's, yielded, it's yielded complacency. Out of that has come laziness. Look, drugs and alcohol just make this easier for people. All right? But it's yielded a nation that says, peace, peace. And guess what? There is no peace in, in this country. You know, struggle is good, folks. Struggle is good for us. I remember, like, hard times, they create a marker. They create a marker for us in our lives. I, I remember a time many years ago where we had a car, and the heater on the car, I lived in North Dakota, and it was 20 below zero, and the heater on my car, the, the fan blower didn't work, and I, I, didn't have, I didn't have 20 bucks to buy a part. I didn't have the money to fix it. And so in North Dakota, if the fan motor on your heater doesn't work, you, and you're driving in that kind of weather, you will literally ice up your windshield from the inside for, with your breath. I know it's hard for you to imagine that in California. So I literally had to drive to work with my window down in order to stop my windshield from icing up. Because I just didn't have the money during that month to fix that, that problem that happened. You know, I didn't have the money for it. To this day, whenever I have a car that breaks down, because guess what, folks? Cars break all of them. It's just a matter of time. Whenever I have a car that breaks, and I either have the money to buy the part or I have, the, you know, I have the means to take it in and have it fixed, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful. I think back to that time. I think back to you know, driving down a country road in North Dakota when it's negative 20 degrees outside with my window down because I didn't have the money at that time to fix it. But look, even hard financial times, I'm very thankful for those things. I had a, I had a grandpa, uh, my grandpa on my dad's side, I was very close to him. And he lived through, um, and I just, I just loved this guy so much. I loved his attitude and his perspective on things. I was very close to this man. I was as close to him as my, as my own dad. And he had lived through the Great Depression. And if you've ever had a chance to become close to somebody who's lived through the Great Depression, they have a much different perspective on things. My grandpa would see us butcher chickens on, on, the, on the farm, and he would just be appalled that we didn't pickle the, the feet of the chickens because we're wasting. Because he actually went through times when there was no food. He went through times when there was no money. He went through times where they had to literally go hungry because there was, there was nothing to eat. I mean, that, that you can't even, unless you know somebody who lived through the 20s and 30s, you can't even wrap your head around that concept today. My grandpa, he kept every single piece of the machinery that ever broke on the farm, and he lined it on a fence. Why? Because he likes a junky place? No, because he never knew when he might need a part. He never knew when you might need to take an old chain off of something and make a chain to, to work on a machine that you had. There was no Amazon back then. You just had to keep things going, and they appreciated, you know, not wasting things. But those times in his life, those hard times, they define the rest of his life. So look, folks, if you're struggling you know, in your life, you may not rejoice in it at that time, but you should. Because that struggle in your life will help you not become a complacent person as you live the rest of your life, as you run the rest of your race. Which, guess what? In the Christian life, it's your whole, it's your whole life. It's your whole life. So look, America, today, this idea of complacency, this is the number one problem we have with the gospel. It's complacency. It's that people don't care. So with us in our lives, let's not let it creep in even the, the slightest bit. Let's, let's keep complacency out of our lives. Look, it'll help you keep sin out of your life, too. 
it'll help you keep sin out of our lives. But this is why. This is the one reason. You're saying, why am I walking around? You have those days out soul winning. Why am I walking around with these two bags of gold bars and nobody wants them? It's because people are complacent. They don't care. They're sitting on their lees. They're at ease. And they should be trembling. This is why. Okay, this is why. Let's not let it creep in to our Christian lives because we should always be striving for that mastery, keeping ourselves, you know, temperate, under control, and just growing, 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 especially in our Christian lives. All right, we should be the opposite of complacent. Let's bow our heads and have a...